Hey everybody, Eric here. This is Radical Slice, my attempt to recreate old uh, NES games mechanics in Pico 8. Uh, the series is about Kung Fu, and in our last episode we added a boss, and the idea of this boss is that uh, it's, a, it's a big old tree that's going to throw some apples at you, and we kind of nailed the animation, but we did not draw the apples yet. So we're going to start off this week's installment by uh, drawing some pixel art apples and making them spin around. So let's just like start the music and uh, jump right in for some sprite work. I think that will do for our basic rotating apple. So eh, eh, eh. just picture it sailing through the sky majestically before the player punches it out of the air. Um, now I'll just add this baddie type to the baddie manager. Actually, now that I look at the existing code, I may want to have a different um, list in the baddie manager to handle projectiles. Because if I look at the player collision stuff, we're like iterating over baddies. We're talking about you know walking and having this hug state and stuff. So there might be a way to like abstract that out nicely, um, but I think it's probably just more straightforward to just have like projectiles up here um, and have some of the functionality be duplicated, but uh, it should give us more control because I, I don't want the projectiles to collide with other baddies and to stop. I just want them to fly straight into the player um, and, and do things that way. And as soon as they impact with the player, they should disappear, which is like totally different than the way the normal baddies work. The, bat the normal baddies just hug the player Projectiles should just hit the player and, and self-destruct. So yeah, I think it's probably more straightforward to just handle them separately. All right, just to give a quick update on where I am here. Um, yeah, I got the throwing thing working. So when the boss switches to the throw state, it also spawns an apple. And that actually looks pretty good. Um, so yeah, I did the kind of quick and dirty solution. Let me jump over to the code real quick where projectile, there we go. So yeah, I'm reaching directly into the batting manager from the boss uh, object, which is like not great. Um, probably I would prefer to do some sort of message passing situation here like I did with Kiko in my last series. Um, but I'm trying to go without Kiko this time to see how that works to try something different. So anyway, um, and if you're curious about uh, you know the sort of event driven stuff, you can check out the, the three rooms series. But yeah, so quick and dirty, just um, calling new projectile and adding that to the batting manager uh, list of projectiles. And that is drawn and updated uh, just like the regular baddies, except for uh, the projectiles, if they go off the screen uh, for some reason, I don't think that would ever happen. They would probably impact with the player or, or be punched by the player. But if they do, they, they kind of get cleaned up um, similarly for the draw functionality here. So um, I think what I'm going to do now is there's a couple kinds of collision that I need to check for. I need to see if the apple impacts the player 
directly, uh, in which case the player would take some damage. Um, and I also need to check if the app would impact with the player's uh, fists or feet, in which case uh, we would uh, remove. But I guess in either case, we've removed the projectile from the screen. So yeah, let me start by like actually hitting the player and deducting a little bit of health and see how that goes. That was pretty straightforward to just do the player projectile collision. So same thing in main, where a lot of the collision logic lives right now. Uh, I'm just calling this batting manager player projectile collision function. And then if it succeeds, we'll, we'll do some sort of action to the player. But for right now in the batting manager, we just loop over all the projectiles. We would only expect one at any given time, maybe two, but just in case. Um, and then if we detect the collision, we just drop it. We remove it from the projectiles table and we return true. So we need to let main know um, whether or not it found a collision. So if there was no collision, it'll just return false. And then main will know it doesn't have to tell the player about anything. Um, but if we do detect a collision, we'll return true. And you can see here that when the apple hits the guy, it uh, it disappears. So that's kind of what we want. Collision looks like maybe it could be a little friendlier, like it's disappearing a little sooner than I than I want. So I may reduce the size of the bounding box on the, uh, the apple. But uh, as a start, that's good. So next, let's uh, remove a little bit of health from the player when this happens. So one bug that uh, was biting me and, and will occasionally bite me in languages that have closures like this. Um, so in my function, the batting manager, where I was checking for a collision, I'm iterating over projectiles with a for each, um, which is cool. And what I was doing is I was returning true here, right? Thinking that cool, like if I detect a collision, I'll just return true from player projectile collision, otherwise I'll return false. And then main can do what it wants with that. The problem though, is that when you use a for each, um, you introduce this like uh, Lambda here, this anonymous function that will be applied to every projectile. So I was returning from returning true from that function, not from this outer function. So basically that value is just being lost. So to get around that, I just introduced this uh, count value in the outer scope. I, I could have used the Boolean here too. That would have been fine. But uh, for every collision I detect, really there'll probably only ever be one. I just add one to count and then I return that. So then in main, uh, I just check to see if the number of collisions found with projectiles is greater than zero. And if so, I deduct some health from the player. Um, and uh, that's pretty easy. I, I kind of, I had been deducting health from the player in the hug of death situation too. Um, and so I just like pulled this into like a, a quick method here that will make sure we never go negative. And that seems to be working. So if we restart this and let the player take a shot in the face, bam, we go down from 100 to 80 because I said to deduct 20 health, which might be a little bit harsh, but uh, oh man, you can't even duck under the apples. Rough, okay, cool. So, and this should hopefully kill him. Yep, great, uh, cool. So now we need to give the player some way to defend themselves. Uh, so let me work on the combat collision with the projectiles. Okay, combat collisions in two. That only took a couple of seconds. Um, I just, uh, the existing combat collision, I just added a section for the projectiles and did the same logic, just deleted it on collision there. Um, I want to see what happens if I try to punch low and kick low, though. I would expect that the um, player's hands and feet would not collide with a, an apple up high if I'm punching and kicking down low. But let me just give that a try and see. Yeah, it looks like looks like the player is taking damage, which is what we would want. We only want to be able to kick and punch like kind of high up stuff. Um, actually, let me maybe I'll move the apple up a little bit on the Y plane just to make it more visually uh, consistent. Hold on a sec. Now it looks like the, the fist actually isn't uh, reaching. Maybe if I move the fist bounding box up a little bit, let me see where the fist is drawing here. Ah, 
Oh, it looks like it's off by just a pixel. So maybe I can get away with it without tweaking too much. I can just move this down one more pixel and that should catch it. Let's see. Yeah, that works. That's probably all right. And it looks high enough that, you know, it looks like you'd want to punch high or kick high. But if you're low, yeah, it, it like doesn't, it doesn't work. It like just doesn't quite make visual. It kind of like the kick is like almost high enough. I kind of want to move the uh, fist up a little bit more because it almost looks like it like doesn't make sense there. Oh, well, that's probably fine. We'll leave it for now. All right, so right now we have the boss just throwing an apple every couple of seconds. Um, that's obviously not realistic. So we want to kind of have it alternating between apples up high and apples up low. So let me uh, tweak the AI a little bit to do that um, and also kind of break up the uh, the timing of that with some randomness. Uh, so yeah, let me let me add some more interesting behaviors in. But we have all the pieces, right? Um, we have the throwing bit. We have to add the low throwing bit still. And we have the sort of running away thing that the, bad, the boss does when you get close enough. So I, I think we could start kind of tying this all together to make it a more a more complete boss-like experience. Okay, I had to tweak a few things uh, to get this feeling the way I wanted it to. Um, notably, uh, I made the apple smaller after all. I was kind of like debating when I had to do that, but it felt felt like the thing to do. Um, and that just made it a little bit more visually pleasing. So you can see the baddie will sometimes throw upwards. Hopefully he throws downwards that time. Cool. So there's like a 50-50 chance that they'll throw uh, up or down. So that's cool. And like the 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 attacks kind of look like they connect the right way. You can't if you're punching low, you know, you can't hit the up high ones. And if you're punching or kicking high, you can't hit the low ones. Let's see this one will hit me. So that's cool. Um, let me turn off the bounding box and the player's arms and feet. Yeah, a couple notes like on how this looks. Um, I want the punch to be a little bit higher and I want the kick antic. Oops. I want to like get rid of the foot part of the kick antic because it looks like it's going to hit low, even though it actually doesn't, right? There's no collision on this frame. So I think like that's good. Like visually, it's hurting things a little bit. Let me just make that quick tweak. All right, I think that is better. Um, it kind of looks like even the kick antic now is kind of like a little bit higher looking. Hold up. So yeah, like it's kind of kind of jank looking. Maybe I can tweak that a little bit more, but uh, I think this part is kind of funky looking. Let's do that. There we go. So that, that does look like he's about to kick a little bit higher. Um, so hopefully that removes sort of like the visual, uh, not inconsistency, but it was, it was a little bit like visually confusing. I think that it looked like the kick was going to, even the high kick would hit low, whereas I think this is a little bit clear of like what's going on there. Um, it doesn't look as cool, but eh, it's not bad, I guess. I do kind of want the punch to be a little bit higher visually. Maybe I can like tweak that real fast. 
Okay, yeah, I'm I'm much happier with how this looks now. The punch and kick antic, like the the full punch and the the kick antic, doesn't look quite as cool. But uh, I think I'll live with it for the the less like visual confusion that we get with this. So yeah, that's a boss. Um, all right, one thing I have to turn on is like he should only back away like some of the time. Like right now, he definitely always backs away. But that needs to be like a a sometimes kind of thing. Let me just make that tweet real quick. So I'm always checking the uh, collision with the buffer, and then I, I do some, I, I run Rand uh, to see if we want a, the boss to back up or not. Keep in mind that this is running every frame, so we need to set the probability that the boss will choose to back up to be like quite low, right? because if we're going to run this 30 frames a second, the chances that it will choose to back up are like quite high, <laughs> right? At some point, it, it like very, it'll choose that very quickly, right? Um, and so I said it to be basically the rand rand is always going to give us the value between zero and one. Um, and so I said it to ninety two. So ninety two percent of the time it'll decline to back up. It'll stay. It'll stand its ground. Um, but if it's greater than ninety two uh, or point nine two rather, then it'll back up. So you can see that sort of uh, if we jump over to Pico eight real quick here, it'll take a second for it to back up, which is kind of what we wanted. It doesn't do it immediately. It'll it'll sort of it'll think about it. It'll think about it for us. Um, some other tweaks we could potentially make there would be that it, it won't like uh, cancel out of its its attack uh, uh, animations. But uh, as it is, I think this is pretty decent here. I've made some adjustments to the screen layout a little bit, the OBS layout. I think I'm cropping things a little bit better, and I was able to make the terminal a little bit larger when I'm in this mode. So I hope that helps with visibility a little bit. Let me know if this is preferable. Since we've got the boss working in a way and we have the baddies spawning correctly and we have the level clearing thing working correctly, I'd like to kind of put this all together into a short level. So what I'll do is I'll set up uh, some baddies to spawn at certain times from various points and we'll let the player fight their way to the end until we get to the boss and then they will defeat the boss which will spawn kind of at the end of the level um and then hopefully the player can actually just walk to the edge and clear the level hopefully that'll work i guess we'll find out I introduced a pretty interesting bug for myself, so I figured I would uh, show it to you. My bugs. Let me show you them. So I needed a way to trigger the boss being spawned. So in the uh, level struct from before, I just added the position at which the boss should spawn. In this case, when the player reaches uh, 60 on the map, position 60, that will trigger the boss. And I thought I was super smart. Um, because I could reuse my should spawn batch function from before and just check the player's current position against the planned boss sort of entry spot. Um, and of course, if the, the baddie manager's boss was set to, to nil, right? So that this way we know that the boss hasn't spawned yet. So let me show you what happens when I uh, actually go ahead and fight this guy because it's pretty neat. Hopefully I kill him. Hold on. Okay, so... We'll just uh, fight him until he dies. Oh, and he respawned again. <laughs> so I killed him, and he just he just came right back. And he's facing the wrong direction, and he's also on top of me. And I don't think the player would even be able to move in a situation like this. 
and he, he can hit me because the apples spawn right on top of me. So really, this is just a nightmare. Um, <laughs> the reason this happens is this foolishness here. Uh, so I don't remember when I added this exactly, but when the boss runs out of health, I just set the batting manager boss to be nil, and we're all set. The problem is uh, that when I do that here, then the next pass through the update loop, um, batting manager boss is nil, and the player's position makes sense, so the boss just respawns again. Uh, so yeah, that's not great. Um, I think probably the way to get around this is to add like a, a state to the boss, uh, which would indicate that they are dead. And so that would, and we'll update like, you know, collision logic and stuff so that everything gets ignored if the boss is dead. But that would sort of prevent the uh, respawning issue that we're having now. Let that be a lesson to you. Don't use nil to indicate like basically anything. Nil is, uh, nil is poison and you should avoid it <laughs> at all costs. All right, let me see if I can whip up a fix for that right now. I just had to squash uh, what was a pretty interesting bug. So let me let me demonstrate what the problem is. So I, I made the fix already and I stashed my changes. Um, so I can show you what it was like before. Let me just get to the boss to show you this. Okay, notice how the boss uh, spawns right here. And if we look at the code, um, we notice that the boss has an X coordinate, right? And that's it. And we're telling the boss kind of which X coordinate to spawn at. And when we draw, when we draw, we're just drawing based on that X coordinate. So, uh, and there's like some extra junk in this uh, sprite call that I don't need, but let's put that aside for a minute. Uh, we're basically, unlike the player, uh, which has both a, a map X coordinate and a draw X coordinate, if you'll remember. You can see the draw X here and the map X here, but unlike the player, the baddie only has a single X coordinate. So what happens is when we do our kind of funky uh, scrolly part. Watch what happens when I walk away from the boss. You can see that the, the background scrolls or the, the grass scrolls, but the, the boss sort of comes with me, which is not, uh, not desirable, right? We kind of want the boss to be left behind uh, if we walk away from them. So now let me show you how we can go about fixing this. What I did was I introduced a new uh, function on this boss object uh, called get draw x, which is just like looking at the player's current map position and offsetting by some value. This is like pretty tricky to explain, so I'll probably have to lean on uh, a paint session to actually communicate what's going on. But if the boss is facing direction one, which means they're facing to the right, then we're going to subtract their position based on the player's current map position. And right now I'm accessing the player directly. You'll, you'll forgive that, I'll fix it in a minute. I'm accessing the player global directly and I'm using their map position. So if the player is between, in this case, uh, the left-hand side of the screen and the middle of the screen, then we won't do anything. This value will end up being negative, right? And so this max function is gonna say to not change the boss's X position and just draw it with the, the current position. But as the player moves to the right, um, and this value becomes larger than zero, this guy here, as this becomes larger than zero, that means that the player is kind of walking to the right and they've, they've gone past the uh, 64 on the map. Uh, and that means we can offset the baddie's position in the negative direction. So let me, let me just draw that in paint real quick. It'll probably be easier to see.
Okay, so bear, bear with me for a minute. Um, here's our, our boss character on the left, and they're facing to the right in this case. And our player is currently like right in the middle of the screen here. We'll call that map X is 64. So if the player is anywhere in this area, like anywhere here, then that's fine, right? Uh, we want the screen to draw the tree normally where where it is like use the trees x position to actually draw it because in this case the trees x position is going to be somewhere around like uh you know like 32 or something assuming this is zero on the screen and this is 128 uh so we, we just want to draw it normally the tricky part is when the player starts going this way so let me use a different color for here um if the player's on this side of the screen then this is going to be map x for the player is going to be greater than 64. And what we want to happen is if the player is walking in this direction, we want the tree to go in this direction, right? So even though the tree's actual x value, 32, is not going to change, we want the draw, the, the drawing spot, the, the point on the screen which it draws to be offset in a negative direction. And so that's why we're going to take a look at the player's x position the map x position and subtract it from the tree's x position, which means this value 32 is going to slowly decrease and eventually go negative, right? So we can see that here. If we go back to look at the game, we'll see what happens. I think I'll keep this screen layout. So we'll keep paint big and we'll, we'll make Pico 8 small so you can kind of see it happen. Okay, so here we are. You can see the player's map x is 59. The tree is probably at, I don't know, like 40-ish. Um, and if the player moves around like this, everything is fine, nothing happens. But if we move to the right at a certain point, you'll notice the tree will start to scroll off. And that's because right now the player's map X is, what, 91? You can see there. So if we're subtracting 91 from 64, like here, that means we're offsetting the tree's position in the negative, position, in the negative direction, which is why it's being drawn like further and further away. So that was the change that I had to make to make this happen. There was probably a more straightforward way to do this, but look, it, this is what I came up with this morning. Uh, yeah, so that's what we ended up doing. Uh, and this is for the case when the tree is facing to the right. The case where the tree is facing to the left was even gnarlier, and there may be a simpler way to have done this bit of arithmetic. Um, but this this works, right? I'm doing the same thing, basically. If the tree is on the right-hand side of the screen, facing to the left, uh, we'll do some machinations with the player so that if they're, uh, if they're all the way on the right-hand side of the screen, we don't offset the tree's position. But if they're further to the left-hand side of the screen, then we got to do some, some machinations to have it draw in the right spot. So yeah, that was a real pain in the neck to get working correctly, but it looks good now. It looks good now, so we'll just leave it. The great part is, um, I think I'm just gonna leave it like this, but if we scroll way the heck off the screen, the, the tree, is the AI is still running, so it's still gonna launch apples at me and stuff. No matter how far away I get, it'll just go in infinitely. And I think I'm okay with this, actually. Like, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna take that part out. We're just gonna let them. Let that tree be a jerk. Let him throw them apples. Right, before I forget, because I almost forgot, um, let me fix this thing where I'm referencing the player uh, global directly from the patty manager, which is just asking for trouble. Um, instead, I'm going to pass in some sort of offset uh, into this get draw x function here. Give me a minute to do that. Yikes, as it turns out, the boss's exposition is like a really important number. And I ended up having to add that gosh darn offset in a lot of places. I forgot like how vital that, that X value was. Anyway, everything's like working now and I'm drawing the bounding box on the boss just to make sure everything looks cool. Um, one thing I did realize is like, um, I probably needed to like, oh, I probably should like impact the, the velocity of the projectile is the same way that I update the velocity of the baddies, actually, because it's kind of like backwards right now, right? Hold up. Yeah, like as I walk away from it, it actually speeds up. So hold up, I'm gonna fix that too. Okay, this looks a lot more what you'd expect. Um, and actually, I'd already done most of the work for this. So when I was calling the update 
uh, function on the projectiles. I already had this VX variable, probably variable, because I, I think I just copied and pasted this function from one of the other baddie updates. So I just had to like include that into the VX. What is interesting here is that um, just because the boss doesn't have that constant velocity thing that the baddies, the regular baddies and the projectiles have, that like it kind of just needs different information to do the updates, right? So the boss really primarily just cares about the player's position, not necessarily the velocity. Although there probably is some circumstance where like if the player is walking and the boss is also walking, like that could be potentially weird. The thing is, like, based on the boss's AI, the boss doesn't actually, like, walk unless you, like, crowd it. Oh, it just killed me. But <laughs> unless, you, unless you walk up to him and, and kind of crowd him, that's the only time when he's going to back up. So it doesn't have the same necessity to, like, change the velocity based on uh, the player uh, that, that the regular baddies do. So that's cool. Um, I think I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, there's a couple of things that I need to work on. So let me, I think we need to look at the spreadsheet. It's been a minute since we looked at the spreadsheet, hasn't it, folks? Okay, so we can actually like check off a bunch of stuff. So yeah, the bosses, uh, we're not displaying the health bar, but they do have health. Let, let's, uh, let's, let's tweak our requirement here. Maybe we'll do the health bar for bells and whistles later, but the bosses do have health. Uh, we'll take that. They do damage the player, right? They, they, they throw stuff um, and they can take damage. I guess it's the same as health. Um, and yeah, our level format is okay. There is actually one thing that, that I do, that I did realize that I need to add here though. So in exchange for sort of um, cheaping out on the boss's health bar display, which we'll, we'll put off till later. Um, the, we have like, let me jump back, peek away for a minute. We, in terms of enemies, in terms of enemies, we've got these, these regular trees and we didn't even add their like, um, you know, they're, they're threatening pose yet, but we have these regular trees and we got these little guys that force you to crouch and we got the boss, but I realized I didn't make a, a guy that's up high that you can't hit while you're crouching. And that is kind of the whole point, right? I, I want the player to be having to uh, move up and down and turn left and right to get everything on screen. So we need to add some sort of floating enemy. And I think I'm gonna add like a, a dandelion, like, a uh, uh, wisp or whatever real quick um so let me just knock out a quick like two frame thing of that and we'll we'll get that added into the level that shouldn't take too long hopefully we can do that like like right now let's try to do that like right now actually no we're, we're not going to do that right now because this episode is long long enough already so let me just stop eric right there um, and we will save the new enemy for next time. But thank you so much for investing your time uh, in watching this channel. I really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to leave a like or, or subscribe if you just want to be inundated with even more uh, 8, 8x sped up coding sessions and sprite work. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope whatever you're working on or whatever you're playing that it's going well. I hope you're doing great, and I will see you next week. Bye for now.